Good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Looking for some feedback? Yes. Okay, all systems are go. Excellent. Well, hi, I'm Daryl Moore, and welcome to week three. We're so glad you're here. Um, week two seemed to take forever because of that spring break thingy, but week three is going to go by so fast you won't believe it. Uh, we've got lots of stuff, and I'm uh, happy to take you through it. So, each week is a theme. The first week was a sort of introduction and introducing the idea of digital literacy. Uh, week two was all about research, and everybody did a great job with their uh, debate teams, and everybody did a great job looking up uh, their their favorite company and so forth. And so the theme this week is uh, digital citizenship. And so we're going to talk about what that is, what it means, and how it relates to other things. And we're going to introduce some more concepts because everything keeps building. We're going to use the skills you, you learned last week, and we're going to introduce some new things. We're going to have everyone making... Uh, a really great presentation for the, your main assignment, and I'll talk you through that. So we're also going to, in addition to uh, figuring out what digital citizenship is all about, we're going to uh, uh, get clear on these concepts of misinformation and what metadata is and how it relates to some of the assignments that we're talking about, and I'll go through the main assignments for the week. So uh, week one we talked all about digital literacy. What is digital literacy? And we, we gave you several different points, but most people realized it's about learning, uh, knowing, reading, becoming familiar with things, all elements of the mind, all elements of perception. But um, digital citizenship is really about uh, how your actions affect others and, the, and um, the other actions of others affect you. So uh, we want to talk about what citizenship is. And, you know, we just have this habit of putting the word digital in front of everything. If you take the word digital away, what is citizenship? Most of you are going to think about maybe voting or having jury duty. Because if you're a citizen, you're part of a community and you owe things back to that community so that the entire community runs well. You don't have to do everything yourself. But everyone has to play their part in a community. So in a, in a nation state or a government or a, a country, you have duties like paying taxes. We all did that last week. Uh, no one liked it, but the country doesn't run without it. And sometimes you have to sit on a jury. Sometimes you have to vote for people that seem like no choice at all. But these are the actions in, in this country. Now, in the digital world, there are all kinds of communities. Um, in we, we learned what it is to be a digital actor. You guys are all uh, members of different social networks. Each one is its own community. Instagram is its own community. Facebook is its own community. Twitter, uh, lots of different communities. If you play games a lot uh, on the uh, Xbox network or the PlayStation network, you probably know a lot of those people that you're normally seeing with. Sometimes you have to be... The, uh, the, the adult in the room or, or the mommy and tell people, you know, stop misbehaving. And then sometimes you get goofy and somebody else will have to talk about you. So in digital citizenship, we form communities and we have to talk about uh, how our actions affect others and the actions of others affect us. Now, this is a broad concept and it's really too big to just think about it. If we lay the word out there, it just becomes like this giant cloud, and, and you can't really form your mind around it. So we like to break it down into something called the nine elements of digital citizenship. So digital citizenship is this larger concept, but if you break it down into different ways that actions can affect each other, uh, it, it is something that you can get your hand, uh, mind around. And this is the 3.2 discussion, and um, there is actually a web page that we send everyone to. And while you're gonna get this link in the 3.2 discussion, I wanna drop it to you now because it's really something that you should bookmark and just keep for future use. So the nine elements are digital access, digital commerce, digital communication, digital literacy. Digital literacy is a component, it's a part of the larger digital citizenship. Digital etiquette, digital law, digital rights and responsibility, digital health and wellness, and digital security. Now, there may be other aspects, but in breaking down, breaking the big pie into these little uh, pieces, 
you can start to get your mind around it. And what we want you to do in the 3.2 discussion is to start telling each other your stories because uh, this is one of those things where nobody knows everything and everybody can, have, can learn something new from everyone else. So if you have a particular experience with digital commerce, maybe you tried to sell something on Etsy and you got burned or you, you, know, you, you, you had uh, trouble connecting with a customer or, or getting your money back or things like that, tell that story so other people can learn from what you know. And other people will tell stories about you know, digital security. Maybe you were part of that group that shopped at Target and had your credit card information swiped during the Christmas period. And you had to uh, go through a lot of hassle changing credit cards and things. So uh, if you break these elements of digital citizenship down, I'm sure you're going to have um, cautionary tales or, or great tips and information. Digital security is very important. We all used to say, oh, well, I'm just going to use my cat's name for a password. And you're going to use the same password for every single account. And we, we now know uh, how bad that can bite us. So it's a pain to do a lot of uh, unique passwords, but it's work that we all have to do. And there are ways to manage it. I personally use a um, piece of software that can generate uh, passwords for me and remember them, and then I just have to uh, know a few basic passwords, but I have to be able to trust that software. So different people have different solutions for each of these things. Digital health and wellness is something that's going to be becoming um, much, much more important. Apple has just released this watch that tracks all your movements and reminds you to stand up so many times a day and so forth. So all of these are parts of ways that we, we can manage uh, digital citizenship. And uh, in the 3.2 discussion, what will be great is if you all share your stories. Each one of you tells some aspect, some tip, some story, and then we'll all learn and be smarter for it. And uh, that's the beginning of understanding what digital citizenship is about. So uh, digital citizenship is a word that you can use, but it, it's really great to break it down into these nine components uh, to use as a way of focusing in on particular aspects of things you should do right or things that you should watch out for other people doing to you. Now, misinformation is a word I want to bring in here. Uh, disinformation was a term that you guys checked out in week one. And last week, you all participated in debate that we called the misinformation debate. We didn't really have a genuine explanation for it. But um, I want someone to raise their hand and tell me the difference between misinformation and disinformation. Does anybody uh, feel like they, they have a good handle on uh, what the difference between those is? Do I see any hands up? Okay. Uh, I'm going to call on... Uh, Duran Bragg. Hi, Duran. How are you doing? How are you doing? All right. I'm doing good. Uh, misinformation is information that's given to purposely mislead or misguide, and disinformation is just bad information. Um, you might want to flip those, but those are good distinctions. One is intentional, and one is just bad information, but it maybe doesn't have evil intent behind it. So yeah. uh, misinformation is when you accidentally tell people something wrong, and disinformation is when you're intentionally trying to tell people something wrong. So these are both uh, important concepts, and last week we were trying to uh, get you to talk about, or uh, get you look at articles and evaluate them to say, can I trust this? Can I trust this information? And we were looking at official publications, asking that question of what, whether we can trust it or not. But we're all communication vehicles nowadays, and so when you ask the question of can I trust this, uh, you're going to get tweets from your buddy who just heard something, and it may or may not be true. And the problem is we all become sources of information for each other now. And uh, something sensational that sounds like a great story but may not be true can spread around the, uh, the world very, very quickly. So I want to show you uh, two different pieces, and they'll illustrate the difference between them. Um, 
in week one, we talked about literacy, and we said literacy wasn't simply just being able to read the language. It's about all that glue and that subtle communication of what happens when people understand things. So it's actually possible to engage in disinformation without lying. You can say a true fact, but you can say it with a style and an intent that will trip everyone's alarms and make them think it, uh, it's untrue. So I want to show you uh, a meme that was running around on the internet uh, a little while back. Uh, it's an ad for an organization and it's talking about a, a dreadful problem. Jeff has been a professional athlete for over 10 years. For seven years, he's been taking dihydrogen monoxide, DHMO, to increase his endurance. Jeff is now addicted. Without DHMO, he will die in three days. There is no cure. Help stop the addiction. Get the facts. www.dhmo.org. All right. This is an absolutely true statement, but it is presented as if this is a terrible disease. Well, you have to ask yourself the crucial question, what the heck is dihydrogen monoxide? It sounds terrible. I think I don't want any of it. Well, dihydrogen means two parts of uh, hydrogen, and monoxide means one part of oxygen. We also know this is H2O. We also know H2O as water. So they're talking about water here. They're selling the truth, but they're doing it in a way that they're misinforming you. They're disinforming you. Um, it's done as a joke. DHMO.org is a fake website. Uh, it's done as a joke, but it's a way of spreading disinformation by telling the truth. Now, here's another example that is the other side, misinformation. This wasn't intentional, but this actually is from our assignment this week. Uh, this was a headline in the New York Post about two years ago. And does anyone in, this, uh, in the audience here know what this story is? I don't want to tell the story. Someone else can tell it. If you know, raise your hand, and you can explain to everybody what the significance of this photo is. Have any takers? All right. Robert Moore. Hi, Robert. Boston, the Boston bombing. The Boston bombing, right. And that happened almost exactly two years ago. They, they ran the Boston Marathon today. So this is exactly two years ago. So what was the story on this photo? Oh, you're still talking to me? Yes. Oh, the story about the two guys that was trying to blow up the, the marathon. Yeah. Now uh, the, uh, the 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 the, the the bomb blew up, and the FBI started investigating, and they put out the word that they wanted to. Uh, they were they were looking for some people of interest. Two guys wearing baseball caps and carrying knapsacks, and they were asking the public to turn in photos so the FBI could go through it. Now the FBI has been doing this for 20 years, asking for the public's help, or you know, 50 years. They will get the public to feed them information one way, and then they'll go away and into their labs and uh, use it or not use it. But the people, the public doesn't really know what the FBI does. But now in the age of the Internet, when the FBI made this request, people started wanting to play Sherlock Holmes along with the FBI. And so uh, a website called Reddit started crowdsourcing all the same photos that people were turning into the FBI. And in a marathon 36-hour session, people – in the Reddit community were identifying photographs that they thought might be possible subjects, and this photo percolated up near the top. It fit the bill. Now, the thing is, Reddit was actually a pretty responsible digital citizen. They were saying, we're speculating here, we don't know. But they were identifying this photograph. And what happened is that a New York Post reporter peered in on the activity that was happening on Reddit and thought that he could get a scoop on other newspapers. They took this photo and they ran it on the front page without making sure and without checking with the FBI or knowing who these people were at all. Turns out they are not the two bombers. They are just two college students. Can you imagine how awful they felt seeing their picture on the front of the New York Post the day after being identified as bombers? Now, the New York Post didn't have an evil intent 
but they were too fast to rush out. They wanted to get a scoop. They were relying on information that they knew wasn't reliable. And they, you know, uh, they have a journalistic oath to tell the truth. They have a greater degree of uh, responsibility than we personally do. But the problem is, uh, you know, once they print the newspapers and put them on the streets, they can't pull them back. And once you send a tweet, you can't pull it back either. So we all now have a responsibility to take just a second longer and ask, is this really true? Do I know if, if my source is telling me this is accurate or should I put a qualifier on here? I know it's great uh, headline to say these are the guys, but shouldn't you say these might be the guys? Shouldn't you at least, you know, try to get the right information in there? So the New York Post was not trying to deceive everyone, but they made a mistake and they, they were too fast to publish it. They accidentally spread misinformation. And if they can do it, all of us can do it, but we all have a responsibility to try to check ourselves because it's so hard to get this bad information uh, put back in the bottle. So uh, these are all parts of what we're dealing with this week. And I'll talk a little bit more about the Boston Marathon assignment, but that's a, a major episode of that. Now, another aspect that's running in parallel with this, uh, we want to talk about metadata. You guys all looked up metadata. You all have your own personal definition of metadata. In general, it's information about digital files. Uh, you can tell when something was created. You can tell how many megabytes it is. You can tell where it's located. And depending on the kind of information, uh, I collect an awful lot of uh, mu digital music, MP3 files, AAC files, and embedded within those music files is album artwork and the name of the artist and the name of the album and all kinds of information. And I use iTunes. iTunes reads that metadata. So while it's playing the music, that's what the MP3 is made for. It's also reading metadata and giving me a richer uh, experience because it's giving me this additional information about the file. So a new type of metadata is geolocation. And uh, nowadays, we all have smartphones and we're all taking photos with our smartphones and they have the ability to embed our location into those photographs. And this has happened so fast and become so pervasive that a lot of us haven't been paying attention to it. So what I'd like us all to do now is we're going to watch a little video. If you go to the uh, Materials tab and click on the very first link, it's about something called John McAfee uh, arrested in Guatemala. John McAfee is the guy who invented computer antivirus software. He sold out uh, his company, became a reclusive multimillionaire, and was living a kind of weird life. But he's, a, he's an original computer programmer. You'd think he'd be very, very savvy. And yet he was tripped up because he wasn't really aware of what was going on with his phone. I'm going to play this video. I'd like all of you to play it on your own. So if you prefer to play it on your own, because this is not going to stream really great, uh, just mute my sound and then come back when you're done. I'm going to play it for people who just want to watch it streaming. Uh, even if you don't get great video rates, uh, you'll, you'll hear all the audio. John McAfee, the security software developer who disappeared last month in Central America. This morning, he is in a Guatemalan jail cell. He faces questioning in a connection with a murder case. Bob Orr is in Washington with that story. Bob, good morning. Good morning, Charlie and Nora. Well, police in Belize called John McAfee a person of interest in the murder of one of his neighbors there. But until a piece of cell phone technology pinpointed McAfee's location, police didn't know where he was. The problem is, is uh, they're trying to detain me. John McAfee's three-week run from authorities came to an end on Wednesday night when the Silicon Valley entrepreneur was detained at an upscale hotel in Guatemala City. Where are they taking you, John? To jail. With the help of Interpol, McAfee was arrested for entering the country illegally and was taken to a nearby detention center. For almost a month, he had evaded police who wanted to question him on the murder of one of his neighbors in Belize. How many people at the checkpoint? McAfee was not alone. Reporters from Vice.com joined him on his fugitive run to document McAfee's outrageous lifestyle, which now revolves around drugs, sex, and guns. To promote its exclusive coverage, the online magazine published a smartphone picture of McAfee with Vice reporter Rocco Castoro. And that was a mistake. 
A hacker noticed the photo had been digitally embedded with precise GPS coordinates of where it was taken. McAfee was in Guatemala, just across the border from Belize. With his cover blown, McAfee surfaced publicly to deny any involvement in his neighbor's killing, saying he only ran to escape a police witch hunt. At that point, I decided I had to do something. Went undercover. I'm now here, and I am now going to speak out, and I'm going to speak out big time. McAfee made millions developing sophisticated cybersecurity programs that still bear his name, but he was tripped up by a basic piece of smartphone technology. Most people don't realize it, but these little things carry a lot of information in them. Joel Brenner, who until 2009 was a top counterintelligence official, says unless the GPS function on your smartphone is deactivated, your location is no secret. This is a tracking device. There's no question about it, and we're all carrying one now. McAfee, who is no longer connected to the software company that bears his name, has not yet been charged in the murder in Belize. Right now, he's still in a Guatemala jail asking for a political asylum. John, Nora? Bob Orr, thank you. Interesting about iPhones now. Yeah. We're all being tracked in some way. Wherever you are, somebody knows. Yeah, that's how they found him. Now, we're not interested in whether or not John McAfee committed a crime. We just wanted to talk about the cautionary tale of someone who made a fortune selling computer software not being aware of what's on a cell phone. And the newspaper or the the, the news report tends to sensationalize things. They're trying to make a kind of a scare story out of, oh my God, your cell phone is tracking you. Well, of course it does. It has to know where it is in order to find a cell phone tower or a Wi-Fi channel. That's how it works. And so the question is not to be afraid of your phone, but to be aware of how it works and to be able to control it. John McAfee wasn't aware. And they said in the uh, report, a hacker pulled this down. A hacker didn't do it. A digital citizen did it. We all have control over the GPS metadata in our fo photos. You don't have to be a, a hacker to know how to do it. I'm going to take you to a website where we can do it right now, because in assignment 3.5, location, 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 we're going to give you a, fo uh, a, folder, a folder full of images that we took with a cell phone around the iPhone, uh, the, the full sale campus, and we want you to load them into this site. This site is called Verexif. There are lots of places that can read uh, 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 photo photographic metadata. But this site just does that, and that's all. I, I loaded up a photo from my desktop. It's showing me the photo. So this is a photo from the Full Sail campus, and it's telling me about the metadata. It was shot with an Apple iPhone 4. It was shot on January the 3rd, 2013. Uh, it's a certain size. It was done shot with a, uh, a lens with a focal length of 3.8 millimeters and uh, an aperture of f 2.8. And then down here at the bottom are the GPS latitude, longitude, and altitude settings. It even tells you how high we are. Now, we're in Florida, not very far from the ocean, so we're only 20 meters above sea level. It's not very high. But these two sets of coordinates here get plugged straight into a Google map. This is a standard Google map that I'm showing you down here. And so it shows you the location. Now, you say, well, Orlando. Of course, you already knew Full Sail is in Orlando. Well, I'm zoomed out. What happens if I keep zooming in? This Google map is in very accurate. It actually has all the buildings on our campus. So if I keep zooming in, you start to see the buildings of the Full Sail campus. So we, in assignment 3.5, it's called location, location, location. We want you to download these photos and be a sleuth. We want you to figure out where on campus. We know most of you haven't actually been to the campus yet but you've seen photos of it, you've seen our website, you've, seen, you've got a lot of information about the school from our website. So we want you to combine those photos and these GPS coordinates with the photos on the website and try to guess where each one of these locations is. Now I'm gonna give you this one. This is part of our back lot. We, we built a lot of fake exteriors where film students can film uh, assignments and things. So this is the back of a, one of our buildings and, and it's an area that we call the back lot. Um, and uh, it's right next to the game studio and so forth. So uh, you don't have to be entirely accurate. We just want you to make a guess. But we, uh, if you load each of these photos into Verexif, 
you'll you'll see the photo you'll be able to see exactly where on a google map it lays and we just want you to try doing what the uh the fellow who who uh um told the police where john mcafee was use geolocation to find something now the reason we're spending some time on this is that we think that as a digital citizen you should be aware of this because you all have cell phones you're all taking these photos you may not be realizing that you've got this information on the photos now i don't want to be i don't want to uh scare anyone but you need to be in control of what you create uh if you're somebody who just ran away from a bad boyfriend who was stalking you and you just took a, a, a shot of your your new lo secret location you may want to strip that information off before you load it up to the internet you have control over this if i show you this website here there's even a button where i can remove the exif data off this photograph i can scrape it because software will do that for me now i don't want anybody freaking out because most social websites that take photographs are very responsible uh, Facebook and Instagram, they automatically scrape that stuff off before they load it because they know people aren't really aware of it. Now, there are other photo sharing sites that take full advantage of it. If you, if you load your photos up on a site called Flickr, they'll give you a handy Google map just like this. And imagine if you took a road trip and you, you drove across country with a bunch of friends and you took a thousand photos. If you loaded all those photos into um, uh, software that could read the geolocation, You'd have an excellent way of looking back and remembering your trip because every single photo would be plotted to a point on a map. So this is really useful, but it's really necessary for you to be able to control it. And it's very easy to control. You can turn it on and off. If you don't want to use it at all on, a, on a Apple I, iOS, uh, it's called location services. You just go to the control panel, turn off location services, and any uh, application that's accessing that won't get access to it anymore. But you can even do it on a granular level. Uh, as you're taking the photo, as you're in the photo app, uh, you can turn it on and off. And, and same kind of control for Android as well. So as long as you become someone who's aware of geolocation and you use it uh, with your knowledge, it's a great thing. But we don't want you tripping into these things uh, accidentally. I doubt if many of you are going to be you know, committing a murder and, and getting caught uh, with it that way. But there are all kinds of ways that um, if you're not aware of the information you're sharing, you can accidentally share things that you don't want to share. And that's what we're all thinking about this week as digital citizens. So, uh, again, that's an, one, another one of our assignments. It's called Location, Location, Location. There's a, a, a folder full of images that you can download. Anyone who has trouble downloading those images, contact your teacher and it shouldn't be an issue. So... Let's talk about assignments for the week. Uh, there's a discussion assignment and there's a main assignment. And the discussion assignment this week is something we call cold case. And it's really fun. It's another chance to be highly creative. So uh, if I, if I uh, grab the instructions here, um, cold case is like looking backwards in the same way that science fiction looks forward. In science fiction, you say, what if we could read minds? What if we could travel through time warps or uh, black holes or whatnot? You ask what if, and then you imagine how the world would be different if you had this capability. And in cold case, we look back at historical periods and we say, how would this event have worked out differently if they had X bit of technology or awareness? So this week, or this month, the assignment is the Prohibition Era. If you're not familiar with Prohibition, this is a great use of Wikipedia. Just look it up, get yourself familiar. Uh, you should have all had it in history. Prohibition is the era in the 1920s when the US, United States outlawed alcohol. And they, they had great intentions. A lot of bad things happened because people drink too much, but uh, people still love it. And um, once the tap was turned off, uh, a great portion of America still wanted to get a drink. So the 1920s were marked by a period of illegal activity where um, people were supplying illegal alcohol and a huge amount of the public was um, partaking in it. And so there's um, stories of cops trying to stop bootleggers and, and, and racketeers and gangsters from, from doing illegal activity. There's a story about speakeasies, 
which are private nightclubs. And uh, it, we call it the Roaring Twenties. It's a period in which social uh, uh, customs became much wilder and looser because people were flagrantly disobeying the law. And so you kind of know this era. It's the era of Al Capone and gangsters and Tommy guns and, and uh, that kind of thing. And so we want you to reimagine how it would be different if some of these actors had some modern technology. You're not going to give them all modern technology, but you want to just give them, gift them with some superior firepower or better cars or communication devices. What would happen if they had cell phones? Um, speakeasies had to hide from the police. So what are ways that they could have um, done it better? Maybe they could use texting to, to have flash mobs instead of secret locations and that kinds of things. So what we want you to do is become aware of what was going on in the 20s and then write a scenario about what would happen if they had some bits of modern technology. So you want to talk about how that technology is used and you want to talk about what effects it has. Now when we say scenario, we don't want you to just stop with, oh, if the, if the gangsters had cell phones, they'd know ahead of time when the police were coming, the end. We don't want you to just do the initial act. We want to know what happens in reaction to that initial act and we want to know what happens in reaction to that. It's just like ripples. And so spinning out a scenario means that you have to deal with the repercussions. You have to think through what would happen if you gave uh, police drones to, to find cops, uh, to, to fly over the city and find gangsters and so forth. What would the, how would the gangsters react? And how would the police react to that reaction? So in a scenario, you can't just stop with one turn of action. You have to deal with the reaction and the reaction to that. So spin it around and uh, do something interesting and creative and fun. We also like you to use media in these discussions. So that's really fun. You can start making little uh, memes and, and uh, bringing in photos and, 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 and different things. So this is a chance to show your creativity. And also remember that you have to respond. Uh, I know a lot of you in week one got burned because you did a fantastic digital vision and you had a great write-up and you didn't respond to anybody else. And you're, you're finding out that that's fully a, a quarter of your grade is responding to other people. So again, if everyone gets their cool, fun, re uh, creative response in by Wednesday night on this discussion, then we have a chance to go back and read what everybody's done and you can add to it. You can poke holes in their theories or you can extend their stories. You can, you can ask questions, you can suggest alternatives. You're going to have a lot of fun discussing this if you get involved. So that's the cold case. The uh, main assignment for the week is called the Digital Citizenship Presentation. And here's where we're starting to have a crescendo. We're building on all of these skills that you got. You, you, you learned how to, to do a lot of searching in week one. You learned how to use the database in week two. You started to put things together in a presentation. Uh, last week was about evaluating an article. This week, you're going to do research on a topic, and you're going to pick bits and pieces out of that. Uh, another, hu uh, another part of coming to this assignment was last week's debate. Last week's debate, we said in the debate, you can't use your own opinion. You have to pull your facts from other sources. And that's what this presentation is. We want, you to present, we want you to research the Boston Marathon bombing that happened two years ago, and we want you to talk about how digital citizenship was uh, reflected and affected. We want you to talk about how certain actors behaved. We want you to talk about reactions and things like that. If I go to the instructions here for this assignment, using methods that you have learned this month, Research how the concept of digital citizenship was reflected in the actions of individuals as well as state and local governments after the events of the Boston Marathon bombing. Detail the digital tools used and how the elements of digital citizenship impacted the historical event. For best presentation, include both the positive and negative effects of tools and the technologies on this event and digital citizenship. So, a, a huge part of this event was people having cell phones. The bombs went off at the finish line. There was crowds along the street. Everybody had their own phones out. 
This was the most photographed crime ever. And so that makes a mountain of evidence. There's also surveillance cameras out, not because of, of, of uh, any particular reason, but because it's downtown and there are uh, um, uh, stores and, and banks and other things. So it was standard surveillance, but it actually captured a lot of the activity. People shot video of the actual bomb and they put it up on YouTube. So you can get not just what the, the, uh, the newspapers or the, the TV stations report, you can get the actual sources from the people that, that were there posting their, their personal camera video on YouTube. So we want you to search all this stuff. Uh, we want you to talk about how social media was used. There are lots of really interesting stories. I talked a little bit about what happened with Reddit. That's part of the story. Um, the Boston police were so inundated with requests for interviews that they started their own Twitter account just so they wouldn't have to waste police manpower talking to the press. And they actually announced that they'd caught the killer on Twitter before they announced it in a press release. So again, this is how the world is changing. How is the FBI changing? How is the Boston police changing? How, what, what were the stories of first responders? Who were people that went in and were heroes? Uh, so there's lots of different aspects to this. And you're not responsible for, um, for covering everything. You're responsible for researching this and then talking about the aspects that you find interesting and compelling. So you are an editor picking and choosing. So the more sources you have, you have to have a minimum of four sources. But in my experience, you need to have at least six or eight sources just so you have enough good information to pull from. And it wouldn't hurt to have 12 or 15 sources because if there's a source you don't use, it's, you know, it's not wasted effort. You're going to have uh, more colors in your palette to paint your picture with. But you are using these, uh, this research to pick and choose the elements that you're going to put in your presentation. So when you put them in your presentation, we want you to point to where they came from. We want you to credit sources. We want you to use media. I talked about cell phone video. You can grab it straight off YouTube. You can put it in your report, but please credit it. So I want to show you a couple of uh, presentations. Uh, another aspect of this assignment, last week we said you could use, um, you could create a presentation using anything you wanted. This week we're limiting it. We said everyone has to use Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive. So everyone has to do an online presentation this week. You cannot use PowerPoint on your desktop. If you want to use PowerPoint, use uh, Microsoft OneDrive online. But you have to create and you have to turn in an online presentation. So that's part of the assignment. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, Google presentations that I got. Nice home page, use of media, see that the media is credited. Again, AP Images is going to have an enormous collection. You, you're not limited to AP Images but you used it last week, you know how to use it, you know what's there. Uh, it's a great resource to use what you're doing. Now we want you to make a general statement about uh, digital citizenship. So that can be your intro, that can be your final statement, um, or you can spread it throughout. And this particular assignment, uh, you can organize this any way you want. This person took the nine elements and he didn't really use every el element, but he talked about digital access. And again, looking at the negative and positive, this is exactly what we're wanting. Uh, you use your media and you credit it. He's talking about digital communication, good and bad. Uh, talking about digital commerce. He gives me a credits page. We want to see your credits. Don't. Uh, and even if you use Digo, we really now want you to put your references on a slide. Don't just give me a link to your Digo page. Put your references in the res in the uh, presentation. That's the way we want you to do it. So here's just one more example. Um, if you go into your lab with your teacher, they'll probably give you uh, lots more examples so that you can know. But you get a title page. You get looking at different technology. How, what kind of technology did the police use? We want to look at social media. We want to look at technology. We want to look at hardware. We want to look at software. There are all kinds of aspects to look at from here. Uh, electronic saviors. So he's looking at the heroes. Here he's got some uh, oh, uh, process from the, uh, the, the FBI and uh, maps talking about how, how things are going. Here's stuff that happened on social media. So, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter becomes part of this story. Um, and uh, 
there's lots of material that you can get off of Google, you can get off of uh, YouTube and so forth. So those are a couple examples. Uh, there's no one way to do this. And what we're really looking for is for you to figure out the way that says who you are. So, uh, you know, you don't need to be exhaustive. You need to be um, making creative choices. This is what I think is interesting. This is what I think is important and compelling. And that tells us about who you are as a, a creative artist who's, who's looking at it through this lens. So that's all we're doing this week. It's a lot. So I want you to have fun with it. Uh, remember to go to the uh, materials link in your in the uh, uh, materials tab and click on the web attendance link. And the web attendance question this time is, what's another name for DHMO? And we all now know it's water. So uh, make sure you do your web attendance before you leave. And with that, I'm going to take any and all questions. First question is Eugenia Aaron. Hi, Eugenia. That's me. Hello. Hello. Hey, how are you? Good. Hello. I hear you. Can you hear? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you said that we needed to compress the file for this last assignment. Um, if they're online, do we still need to save them and compress them, or do we just send the link? Um, I I'm happy with just the link. If you put it in a text file, then the text file becomes something that you can compress. But you really, it's not that big a deal to compress a text file. If you're, okay. if you're turning in a PowerPoint document, that's some, the kind of thing you need to compress. But if you're just simply giving us a link, which you can do in a comment to your teacher. Now, uh, the, the absolutely correct way to turn in the assignment is to put it on a text file with your name on it and drop it in because the assignment page actually has a drag and drop slogan. But if you give okay. your teacher the link to your um, presentation, and you don't drop a, a file in there, the teacher will, will uh, not count that against you. You will get graded normally. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else have a question? Um, let's see, is there anything in chat? Uh, I have Microsoft app on my phone. If I save to OneDrive, does that count? Yes, if it's on the OneDrive and you point us to the OneDrive, then that is an online file. Any more questions? Uh, I don't see any more hands up. Any more questions in the chat? Well, uh, thanks a lot, and I'll let you guys go. And I want you to have a fun week. There's lots of great things to do this week. And uh, it's it's good to get started early, because if you get the uh, cold case out of the way, then you can spend lots of time on your presentation. You guys have a great night. Thanks a lot.